Amen, and thank you, choir. It's, this is going to be a little different, figuring out how to do this when I have so many people behind me. <laughs> Just make sure I don't get my tail feathers on fire or anything, all right? I'll ask the gentleman that put, just put us up on the screen our outline for the next several weeks with some interruptions. There will be some little interruptions here and there of other things that we will do. But basically what we're going to be talking about is these things. The platform, the truth as it is in Jesus. Remember again, if we're going to talk about the platform, the truth as it is in Jesus. Um, well, that's okay. We can, just, we can just let it go. That'll be fine. Platform, the truth as it is in Jesus. Any pla uh, Jesus better be the platform on which anything in Christianity stands or sits, right? Um, four posts or pillars that hold that platform in place. Doesn't really matter what order they're in, because uh, if, you're, if you've got something and you have, and that's sitting on four pillars, they better be equal, right? You don't want to have one on top of another. Think of it in terms of S's, the platform, S, salvation in Jesus Christ. The four pillars, Sabbath, second coming, state of the dead, um, Sanctuary, four S's holding up the platform, the truth is in Jesus, the steps to the platform, to get up to the platform of Jesus, L kind of thinking in the context of time, a last day message, three steps leading up to the platform, the three steps, the three angels message of Revelation chapter, um, of Revelation chapter 14. And so that's what we'll be doing with the first one there, the one, the actual salvation or, the, or Jesus is the one we'll actually be looking at, looking at hard here for a few moments today, all right? Again, then we'll have some interruptions when we'll do other things, uh, some other things going on different weeks. But that's basically the outline of where we'll be going uh, over the next several weeks with a little interruption. The 26th will be an interruption where we'll be talking about some things about religious liberty items. We'll be doing that for two weeks from today. So. But other than that, that's the outline that we'll be just picking up and going along the way. Truth as it is in Jesus. Okay. Any of you have ever... When the teenager asks to see the keys, what are they asking for? When a teenager asks, can I, can I have the keys, please? Can I borrow the keys? What are they really asking about? Today we're going to talk about keys. All right? The keys. And if you want to with your Bibles, the place to turn, to look at it, is Matthew chapter 16. Chapter 16, Matthew's Gospel. The keys, my uh, son, a few years back, Jenny, my wife, when Jenny's sitting back here actually involved in the, in the choir, a few years back her grandmother passed away. Robbie was just a little baby, and they went digging and taking care of the things that were all of her earthly possessions. They came upon something kind of odd. They came upon some keys some Ford keys, and the family was talking, and they were laughing, and they said, what in the world are these keys? She hasn't had a Ford since the 60s. After upon further examination, those were keys for that Ford of the 60s. She hadn't had the thing in over 30 years. So, you know, keys, they were ready to throw them out when Robbie said he wanted them. So we gave them to him, and Robbie had keys that he could carry around just like me carry around the keys, okay? And Rob, so he had his keys. I don't know if he still has them or not, but he had his keys, and he had Ford keys just like mine, only one little difference. My Ford keys go to my old jalopy of my pickup. His Ford keys, well, they go to nothing. But he's very proud of those keys as a little guy, okay? As the kid gets a little bit older, as children get a little bit older, as they get to be teenagers, does just having a key in their pocket satisfy? When they're asking mom or dad, can I borrow the keys, please? Is that what they're asking for? Are they saying, I want this? What are they saying they want? I want to be able to borrow the car to take it off, right? Keys mean nothing without car. We're going to talk about keys today, all right? Matthew chapter 16, as we talk about the keys. And it's all in the context of the truth as it is in Jesus. The truth as it is in Jesus. Matthew chapter 16, Matthew's gospel. And I say to you, it's verse 9, verse 18. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the grave shall not prevail against it. 
Verse 19, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in, uh, um, in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Pretty powerful. You are Peter, and I will give you the keys. What does this mean? What's going on here? Whole, gr whole theological positions have been made on this one text. What is this business of the keys? I'm heard whole groups in the context of we have the right to be able to decide who goes to heaven and who does not. See? Have the keys. Okay. But what does it mean? What is going on here anyway? What's happening? First of all, let's try the linguistics. The language. Verse 18, I say to you that you are Peter and on this rock in the Greek, the words Peter and rock are very similar, but they are not exactly the same. Peter bedrock, uh, is not bedrock. It is, the, it is a rolling stone, rock that is not attached, okay? That does not necessarily mean a pebble, a little tiny thing, but it means rock that is not attached, not bedrock. Rock here being used, the word rock is bedrock. Okay? The one that is not bedrock doesn't necessarily need to mean a pebble. The biggest one that is not attached or not bedrock is, where's Jack, my Australian friend, yes, is the thing in Australia, whatever they call that thing. Okay? It's not something you would pick up and walk away with. It is huge, but it is not attached to bedrock, so it is different. Okay? So we can say, see, linguistically, this doesn't fit. The only problem is... Most of the scholars will tell you Jesus probably did not speak Greek. He spoke Aramaic. And in Aramaic, they don't have a distinction in those two words. So there goes your language excuse. What do we do now? How do we interpret this thing? What do we get out of it? Well, could I suggest we try something? The issue is not what do I say or what does somebody else say or what does this group or that group say. The issue is what does the Bible say? And the way to sort that out, I would suggest that... Uh, best way is context. Context, 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 context. How do we sort out what the Bible meant? What did the person mean when they were saying that? In this situation, what did Jesus mean when he said this? What did he mean? And context is our best answer. What does context mean? Check the immediate things going on around it. Use the pebble in a lake principle. Have you ever been near water and thrown a pebble in it? What happens? The pebble, you throw a pebble in the water and it kind of, you get rings. The rings kind of work their way out. And the farther away they get, the, they get smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Does that make sense? So use the pebble in the lake principle. Context. Check your immediate context is the best answer to try and sort out. So that means when you're trying to figure out what something means in the Bible, the first thing to do is check the immediate chapter. If that doesn't give you your answer, then check the immediate book. If that doesn't give you your answer, then check the, the rest of the scriptures. And ideally, when you're dealing with these, different, with these different pebbles, they better all be saying the same thing or else there's something funny going on. In other words, the immediate context should be saying the same thing as the broader biblical context or I've probably got something mixed up. Does that make sense? So stick to your context. Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 16 and see if we can figure out what in the world is going on here when he says I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven all right Matthew chapter 16 we start off and the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and they tested Jesus asking him what he would show them a sign from heaven Jesus didn't even bother with them he says the only sign you'll get is the sign of Jonah three days three nights and you can, see, you can feel the disciples. They're saying, these guys want to hear what you have to say. They want to learn. Why did you ignore them? Why were you, why were you so rude to them? And Jesus goes on in answering. Verse 5, and the disciples came to him on the other side. They had forgotten to take bread. And Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, they thought he was talking about the bread. And if you read on down, Jesus says, I'm not worried about bread. Have you forgotten the, five, the feeding of the 5,000? We made bread out of, some, out of one little kid's lunch. 
Have you forgotten the feeding of the 4,000? Again, out of nothing. Bread is not the issue. And then he finally tells them right out, be careful of the doctrine, the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's what I'm talking about, not physical bread. Ah, oh. now we get into our story. Verse 13. And when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they said, oh, depends on who you ask. You could get all sorts of different question and answers. Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say this one, some say that one. And Jesus said, okay, who do you say that I am. And Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. And that's when Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed to, to this, but my Father who is in heaven. What's the difference from what they said as far as who do they say that I am? as opposed to who do you say that I am? They were willing to accept that you might have been a prophet. You might be the reincarnation of some prophet. You might be this, you might be that. You might even be the forerunner. That's John the Baptist. You might even be that. But notice what they were not accepting is, and you are the one that is the Christ. Now again, what does the Christ matter? The word the Christ is you are the Messiah of the Old Testament Scriptures. You are the one that the Scriptures has been pointing forward to for hundreds, yea, thousands of years that somebody is coming that is going to be the solution to this world's ills. Somebody is going to come being Messiah, the one that is going to take care of the world's problems. That's who's coming. And Peter said, we know that that is you. And Jesus said, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Now notice what happens next. And that's the context in which he says, you are Peter and on this rock. Who are we talking about here now? Are we talking about Peter or are we talking about Jesus? Jesus. Who's the context? Peter doesn't have anything to do with the context. Peter is the one that answers the question and he answers the question about who Jesus is. He doesn't say anything about Peter. And so when Jesus acknowledges him, you are Peter, but on this rock I will build my church, what's the rock? What's the one that we're talking about? We're talking about Messiah as opposed to John the Baptist or anybody else. That's you. All right? Read along farther. And he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one what Jesus, uh, that, that Jesus was the Christ. Timing isn't right. Read a little bit further. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. What's he just talking about there? What's that? What the Messiah means. What it means to be Messiah. What it means to be Messiah is to take away the sin of the world is going to be expensive. It's going to take something. It's going to take sacrifice. It is somebody to actually show what God is like, even to the point of if the devil is screaming, I want blood, I want blood, I want blood, we need somebody to say, fine, take mine. But not just any somebody, but to be the Messiah, he also has to be the creator. That's who this is. And Jesus is telling them what is going to happen here. Again, what does this have to do with anything? Our question is, what is this foundational thing? What is this platform that salvation is built on? Is it Peter or is it Jesus? Further along. Now, Jesus tells him, reading back to it, verse 21, Jesus tells him, 
He's going to be going to Jerusalem. What's going to happen to him? He's going to die. He's going to be resurrected again the third day. Now watch this. The next verse, verse 22, and Peter pulls him aside and he began to rebuke him and to say, far be it from you, Lord, that this should happen to you. Peter says, ain't going to happen in my lifetime. Remember Peter? Peter is the guy that says he's ready to pull out his sword and fight to the death to make sure this doesn't happen to Jesus. Remember? What does Jesus say to Peter? Does it look like Jesus is saying, Peter, you will be the one that is, you're the one that's the context of this discussion? He just told Peter, you're reminding me more of Satan than you are of Jesus. Get behind me. Ooh, the context of Matthew 16 is Jesus, not Peter. You want to go a little further? Let's try this a little. How did Peter think about this? Who did Peter think Jesus was putting in charge here? Acts chapter 3 and 4. God, the story of Acts, the history book, after Jesus goes back to heaven. Acts. Acts chapter 3, Jesus, uh, the, the, this, Jesus has gone back to heaven. Peter and John are walking to the synagogue. There is somebody there that has been sitting right in front of the synagogue for years begging alms. And this guy is sitting there when Peter and John come walking by, and everybody knows him because he's been sitting there for years. Anybody that's been coming and goes, going knows about that guy. And Peter comes along, Peter and John, and they come by, and the guy steps up and says, hey, do you have anything to give me? And Peter looks at him. Now that gets him excited. When Peter looks at him, that means, hey, I've got somebody's attention. I'm going to get something good. And Peter says, look at me. Ooh, this is going to be good. And Peter says, I don't have any money. But I, what I do have, I will give you. Why don't you stand up and walk in the name of Jesus? And the guy tries it. And when he does, he stands up for the first time in years, maybe ever. His legs have strength. Woo! And he did something that might scare some of the church people. He got to celebrating. I wonder why. And the leaders get all upset because he's talking about that Jesus is the one that did this. They throw child Peter and John in jail. They drag them out. Drive chapter 4, they drag them in front, of the, in front of the religious leadership council. And that's when they made their biggest mistake. You read through the story. Chapter 4, they say, And how did you do this? Boy, that was a mistake. Because Peter was glad to tell them. And how did he answer in chapter 4? In the name of Peter, we did this. Is that what he says? I, Peter, did this. I'm the one. I'm the one with the keys. Is that what he says? He doesn't say he's the context. He says Jesus is. He says, let me tell you about Jesus. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth... Verse 12, he comes right out and says it. And there is no other name given among heaven whereby we must be saved. Who did Peter think was the context? By the way, was Peter the leader of the early church? Go to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, you've got a discussion, a disagreement in the Christian church as to who should be doing what and what means what. And they come together and have kind of a council to talk it through. Who was it that spoke up and says, I would say, let's do it this way? It wasn't Peter. It was James. It was James. Most Christian scholars will tell you they believe, and by the way, the early Christian church says, to, says this too, that James was the leader of the early Christian church. Most Christian scholars will tell you they believe that James is James, the brother of Jesus. But it was not Peter. By the way, shall we go a little farther? Shall we let Jesus explain what he means when he says, on this rock I will build my church? What does he say in his prayer when he doesn't even know anybody is listening? John chapter 17. John chapter 17. 
Jesus talking to his father. And this is life eternal, that they might know Peter. Boy. I have a great specialty. Like Greg Hahn. We're both good at putting people to sleep. He's an anesthetist. I'm just a preacher. Did Peter say, or excuse me, did Jesus say in verse 3 in chapter 17, and this is life eternal, that you might know Peter? No. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, God the Father, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. There's no Peter in this. The foundation is Jesus. How are we to be saved again? Is it by Peter? No. It is by Jesus Christ. All right, back to chapter 16 in Matthew. Don't tell anybody about this, he says right now. Don't tell anybody that I am the Christ. Did he mean that forever? No. Acts chapter 1. And Matthew chapter 28, just before Jesus goes back to heaven, what does he say? And you will be my witnesses. Here we go with the pebbles again. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. Be my witnesses. By the way, the word for witness in Greek is martyr. And you will be my martyrs. Okay? You will be my witnesses. Share whatever you have to say. Whatever you, you know, talk about Jesus, not about Peter. In fact, let me even, let me, let's look at it a minute in Matthew 20, 28. Matthew 28. And I want to ask you about a word that's missing. There's a word that is implied and not stated in Matthew 28. I want you to see if you can figure out what the word is. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, 19, and 20. Jesus came and he spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the... What's the word that's missing? It's in verse 19. It's right there in verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples. The missing word is at the beginning. The word missing is you. All authority has been given to me, therefore you go and make disciples of all nations. If you accept, if you believe, by the way, John was there with Jesus in Matthew chapter 16. John was there with Jesus. What did John say as far as how is salvation to be gained? How did John understand what Jesus said? John chapter 1 and verse 12, as many as received him, that is Jesus, he gave the power to become the children of God. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. I didn't write my gospel, this book of the story of the gospel of Jesus to be a biography. I wrote to give enough information to you could understand that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. And that if he is, that you will accept him as your Christ and Messiah and accept salvation in his name. And to anybody that has accepted Jesus as our personal Messiah, our personal, he is my Messiah, I accept his salvation for me, that's where the keys come into the discussion. That's where I have given you the keys. And who's the you? Can I be a little bit southern? Can I be a little bit southern? I know. This is as south as where I came from, probably even more south than where I came from. I know that. But, you know, in American history, the southeast is kind of referred to as the south, and we, we, we southerners get kind of referred to as kind of being hillbillies and talking kind of slow and all that kind of stuff. But we got a word here. The word you. The word you, any southerner will tell you, knows what the word you means. It means y'all. It's a plural word, not a singular word. You means y'all, everybody. If you've accepted Jesus, 
then, t- then you've got the key to salvation and pass it along to other people. Go, therefore, make disciples. You shall be my witnesses. Go and do it. Jesus is telling Peter and the rest of the disciples, if you've accepted Jesus, you've literally got the keys to the kingdom for other people. Not only by sharing it, but there's something else that's kind of funny in the discussion here. Sharing Jesus doesn't always mean words. Some of the most, some of the people that have got the message the best can be some of the most obnoxious people on the face of the earth. And don't they make you want to be just like them? Be my witnesses of what Jesus has done for us, but also in us. And so when he's saying witness, sometimes that means words, but all the time that means act like it. Does that make sense? To those that have experienced Jesus, unlock the prison doors. Unlock the bondage of a world of sin. Show people that the world of sin, the bondage of a world of sin can be unlocked. Show people the key. The key is Jesus. Put it in the lock and open it up for them. Open heaven wide. Because the simple, ugly truth of the matter is we could be slamming the gate, the doors of heaven shut by acting as Christians in such a way that people say, whatever it is they have, I don't want it. Open it up. Because literally, how you deal with the key could have everything to do with whether the kingdom of heaven is opened or loosed by somebody or for somebody. Does that make sense? As people who have experienced Jesus, take that key of Jesus that means so much to you, that means so much to us, and open it up for open the kingdom of heaven for other people by using the key and sharing the key with anybody and everybody. Amen? Because it's not just about the key, it's about the car. It's not just about playing with the key here on earth, it's about opening up heaven because that's where the people of God want to be with their Lord and Savior. Amen? So let's open it up. Let's share Jesus with the world. Folks, salvation is in Jesus. It's not in Peter. Can I say something terrible? I believe in church. I believe God gave church to be the thing to represent Jesus to the world. Many, many, many fine people are in church that have nothing to do with Jesus. The context is not church, it's Jesus. The context is not Peter or the disciples, it's Jesus. Salvation is not by Peter, it's not by John, it's not by Hakes, and it's not by denomination. Salvation is in Jesus Christ. He is the platform upon which everything else is built. He is Christianity. Christianity without Jesus is Antichrist, folks. Jesus is the only way, and Peter knew this. Peter said, don't look at me. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And that name is Jesus. He's the key. Share the key of Jesus. Open the kingdom. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the plan of salvation that is Jesus. We thank thank you that Jesus is creator, that he became redeemer, that he is the Messiah of the Old Testament. We thank you that he has come and that he's coming back again to take his people home, to be in the kingdom of heaven 
But for right now, we thank you that the kingdom of God is open and full and free for anybody. And help those of us that have experienced Jesus to be using that key in a way to open the kingdom of heaven for anybody and everybody is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.